score. So that's measure theory. And I hope you've already gotten the sense by now that this uh, we are sort of doing this abstract measure theory with the idea of using some of this abstract stuff and then later introducing the Lebesgue measure. Many of you might have already seen Lebesgue measure and all that, but we'll use this abstract setup and go forward. And there are there are there are more ways to do this. Huh? This is one approach we are taking. You'll find different people and different books take different routes to achieve the same thing. Okay, so just just so that we are on the same page. So I think we have seen you have seen this. What is a measure sigma algebra? So X is a non-empty set. And then how do you define a sigma algebra and the notation? Just so M and if if you find me differing from anything that you have done in the first part, please do let me know, okay? So we can reconcile that. So M is a sigma algebra of subsets of X, by which we mean what? These conditions are satisfied. Uh, so first of all, of course, M is a non-empty collection of subsets of X, which satisfy these three conditions writing. Can you see my screen, everyone? Yes, yes so ma'am. So what we meant by a sigma algebra. And there are consequences which you would have seen of these three conditions. And once you have a sigma algebra in place, we can define what we mean by a function. When do we call a function from the set x to y? Um, Okay, let me not write uh, tau there. Is said to be measurable if inverse image of open set is measurable. Is in M for all. And this is, of course, F inverse V means the inverse image, not the inverse function or anything like that. Okay. And once we have these notions, then we define a measure. It can be defined in this way. And it must be a countably additive function. So if a1, a2, an, so on are in M and they are pairwise disjoint, are you able to read what I'm writing, everyone? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So then what happens is that the measure of the union of the sets is the addition. So which is the, have you seen any examples of measures? And then after, okay, I hope you have seen them. And then it's the simplest example for me for a measure is you take any set X and you just define fix X naught in X and you define mu to be the point mass. 
I hope you have seen this, and if you haven't, you can check that this is a measure. Okay. So what does it mean? Let me just. This must have been an exercise or something. Mu e is one zero. All right, let me, I'll, I'll write this later. We'll revisit this, don't worry about it. Okay, so now then you have defined for a function f, the meaning of what does it mean? Assuming f is measurable, of course. Indeed, you have all you have defined for any e do we know this? Shall I yeah? Not sigma alpha mu of a intersection. No, that is for simple functions, right? This I mean for any function f. Okay, so that is done in two steps. For example, for you call something a simple function, a function f. So I'm really, so if you have a function like this, and s is of the form, So I, I don't want to go over everything in, uh, uh, repeat everything, but just to refresh our memories. So if S is of this type, So for E belonging to M, we define first. So this is this, these are very special kind of functions. These are called simple functions. And you define this to be simply okay. And then and of course, we will use this convention that because it is allowed that alpha is zero for some i and measure of a i intersection e is infinity. This can happen. So we are right now just defined. So these are simple functions, and for them, we define the integral this way. Okay. And then the next step is to, to make sense of this or this integral for any measurable positive function. Okay. So what would that be? Because you know, this is a fact, you would have done it. Uh, okay, let me not go there right now. So if f goes from So then you will define to be supremum of these quantities. Where the soup is taken over all simple functions, which means simple functions that we have seen here, this type. This is simple function. Okay, measurable, such that 
Okay, I should mention here <laughs> this we may need AIs to be in M. Okay, otherwise it's not clear. It's, I would be able to write the mu of AI intersection even. Okay, so measurable such that okay, so this much I think you would have done in the first part this definition and all the properties of this integral. So the, the thing that you have to remember is that what we did, what you have done so far is for real valued or extended real valued positive functions, okay? So I hope we are all on the same page thus far. And this is called the Lebesgue integral of f over e with respect to the measure mu, okay? So you've seen all this. Now then the new part that I'll start now is to see how to extend this definition for functions which are whose uh, range is not necessarily zero infinity. Okay, shall I proceed now? Okay, so first thing let's recall, if you have a function like this, not like now I'm going to allow all real values, okay? How you can define, you have you seen this? How do we define this? Min of? So minus, uh, minus zero. zero mu. Okay. So for any function, you can do this, and these are measurable. If u is. And u can be written as Right? And these are uniquely determined. By you. Okay. So what we do is, and similarly, now if you have a function f, I could write f as the real part okay and then I can write this further as um, what I do So what's the point of writing these plus and minus things? All of this, u plus, u minus, these functions are non-negative. So uh, mapping x to zero. So we have a good chance of being able to use what we have developed as the Lebesgue integral for non-negative measurable functions to these. And there is, there is really an obvious way if you 
give a minute's thought, uh, a moment's thought to this, you'll, you'll see what should be the extension. How should we define the Lebesgue integral of a measurable function this time? Okay. So that is what I am going to do in the next three, four results in a more formal way. All right. So make, let me make my first formal looking definition. We set so we take this to be collection to be the collection of all complex measurable functions f on x for which Okay, so I'm assuming you know what complex measurable is. So the real part and the imaginary part are measurable. Okay, so you have you should have seen this also earlier. If you haven't, please let me know. Okay, because composition, you would have done composition of measurable functions and you can recover this, okay? So L1 mu right now, I'm not giving any other structure to it. I'm just saying it is a collection of all complex measurable functions f on x for which mod f d mu x is finite. Remember mod f d mu, so we know this is always greater than zero. So it fits right within what you have done thus far. We have defined and if f is measurable implies mod f measurable okay so mod f is a non negative measurable function on x for which we know how to write this lebesgue integral so all i'm asking is you collect all of complex valued functions measurable functions defined on x for which this Lebesgue integral is finite, okay? And we will, I mean, some of you might have already seen it, seen this, and you will see this later. L1 mu has a lot of structure. It is actually a, it can be made into, it's a vector space. It can be made into a Banach space even with an appropriate norm. We will not go there and we'll just, Remember to call all functions here. If f is here, f is called Lebesgue integral. Okay. And now we'll do this formal thing that I have told you already. So make a formal definition of the integral of a complex valued measurable function on x. So if f belongs to L1 mu and f is u plus iv, u, v, r, real measurable functions. So everything, the domain for all these functions is X. Okay, so even if I'm miswriting it, it means it's taken to be X. We will define Okay. 
this integral to be this. So please look carefully. I'm not introducing anything. We don't already know how to define. Okay. For any E belonging to M. So, of course, E is X and there is no problem. Okay. So, I have defined this, but we don't know if these things are finite. Okay. If one of them is infinity, then we have trouble. First thing we know, each of these is defined, right? U plus, U minus, V plus, V minus are non-negative measurable functions. So we know how to define their integrals. And we can put I there. That, that's okay. So this makes sense. Whether it's finite or not, we don't know yet. Okay? It could be infinity, with assuming we are taking I dot infinity to be also infinity strange thing okay but we have one more condition here which we have imposed right in the beginning f is in l1 mu this forces each of these terms in the definition on the right hand side to be finite why because Okay, this is a property of integral for non-negative functions. The order is preserved by the Lebesgue integral. And this we know is finite. So, you, so first term on this right hand side is finite. And indeed you can say the same. Similarly, for each of the other terms. Okay. So, right now we have in place the definition for a, any complex valued measurable function f defined on x, we know what it means, what we mean by integral f d mu over e provided. Actually, I mean, I should say that this thing that I've written at the bottom of page eight makes sense, even if f is in not in L1 mu, it could be infinity, but if it is in L1, mu, we know this integral is finite, okay? And I mean, this is obvious if V is zero, which means F is just real valued, but not necessarily non-negative real valued, the same uh, um, definition will give us the value of integral F E d mu. You will just assume small v to be zero, v plus is zero, v minus is zero, and these last two terms will vanish, okay? Let's slowly proceed to see that this is a linear operation, Lebesgue integral that we have defined is linear, and you would have done this for the real case anyway. So a little bit of work, the same kind of idea, but this will get help us get used to the various definitions. So suppose F and G
so so this is already what are we showing here what does this mean alpha f plus beta g is already in l1 mu so provided we know that l1 mu is non empty this becomes a what will it become what will the first condition here show you about l1 mu assume that it is non empty anybody ma'am it is vector space exactly so showing you that it is actually a vector space okay and we also this is also telling you how to compute the integral of alpha f plus beta g it is as one would expect and you would have done this already this formula for fg non negative alpha beta in r plus in uh, yeah in zero infinity okay so let's uh, quickly do this prove this so first thing before we can write this integral is to check alpha f plus beta g is measurable then we need to check that alpha f plus beta g is l1 is in l1 mu and then we come to the formula so why is alpha f plus beta g measurable we've already done this yeah yes ma'am okay okay and then and you know the order preser preservation property for non negative functions integral so you will be able to say this and now i am using exactly what i said the corresponding property for positive reals and non negative measurable functions yes and now so this much is okay but there could be just infinite terms somewhere but because we know f and g are in l1 mu it means these two integrals on the right hand side can you see here are finite so this is infinity since both f and g belong to l1 mu so that shows us what what have we proven by doing this anybody kya proof kya what have what have we done to, so far alpha f plus beta g is uh, you know libig integrable and that's why yeah it's here. okay and then the second part okay so as you do for uh, in vector spaces i mean it's enough to show the separately it's enough to show that f plus g d mu i mean you can take alpha and beta as one and separately show that alpha f d mu is alpha outside integral f d mu so as in so together it will give us
yeah separately we can show that now this is for all alpha n see i hope i wrote that yeah okay and considering how we have defined integrally f plus g d mu that will be in terms of so see the definition at the bottom of page eight so if i could prove the corresponding things about u plus and v plus then we'll get the the other things also yeah is that okay so i'll write down the statement let me know if you agree otherwise we have to do a bit more work Mm, let me call this okay. We call it three. Is that correct? Will this be fine if I do it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, because for the for the imaginary part, there's just the uh, the iota which comes out, and the other things work the same way. So, if there's anybody who cannot see this, please uh, please let me know. So, this is my first lecture with you. I want to go as slowly as possible. So, make it. We have to get used to each other. Okay. All right. So this I, I'm assuming everybody is comfortable with this. So let's assume. Therefore, that so there is no imaginary part here. And we put uh, H will also have a positive and a negative part. Okay, so I'm just writing H as H plus minus H minus, and this will be okay. And now we are fine in the sense that every function on the left hand side in the sum is non negative. Every function on the right hand side in the sum is non negative. So I can break up this integral using the corresponding property for non negative functions. Yes. Uh, so this implies, why does this imply this, what I've written? Because each of the integral is finite. No, not just because of that. Because each are non-negative function. Yes. And you have done the additivity of the integral for non-negative functions. You have, haven't you? Yes, ma'am. So sometimes I might forget to write d mu, but it should be clear. Okay, and now I bring back everything. So this, this 
corresponding things. And this should be just the Yeah. Is that okay? I do I I think I'd say that so this f plus and f minus are uniquely determined by f always. Okay, so the integral defining integral f or integral g in this way makes sense. That you have to always check. If you're writing something in terms of a representation, it might be possible that more than one representation is possible. So you have to check for uniqueness. For example, I mean to say, what if you could write this? Then there would be two possible ways of defining integral f. But we know that f plus and f minus are the unique things. We've defined them in a particular way for f, okay? Because actually, otherwise, you could always add something here and subtract something here, some constant even. Okay. So that takes care of what have we done so far? This is done. Yeah. So we have finished this one. And we go back to the, the scalar multiple. So we have to prove four now. Okay, how, any idea how, well, how can we proceed with this? What have you already done? For alpha positive, uh, we have already done that case. You have done? For alpha non-negative. What have you done? You have done this one. Yes. And you've also done the same thing for? Okay, and uh, okay, I have okay. Uh, so the the assumption that f and g were real were only for the for three. Okay, this we can just make u and v here. Okay, this is what I mean. Now this is true anyway from your previous positive, non-negative integral properties. So therefore, can I say this? Does this follow easily then? Is that okay? Can you hear me people? Class, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So may I have a response please? Do you want me to write the extra lines here? Or this is, you can see this. No, ma'am, it is okay. Alpha is written as alpha plus minus alpha minus, and we can continue in the same way. Yeah, yes, we can continue this way. And just now, similarly, let me see if alpha is minus one, what does alpha have become? It will simply be minus eight. Yeah, 
So similar thing will be true for alpha okay, something has happened with my pen. Okay, is there any other value of alpha for which you can immediately read? We can, yeah, we can write it as positive part into minus one. So this is fine, right? Then this is okay. Yes, ma'am. No, what I'm saying is I've, we have seen this for alpha is greater than zero. So it for alpha minus one. Similarly, can you think of some value for, of alpha different from these two, obviously, for which we can straight away write for alpha equals to i exactly and why is that so similar thing so what will be alpha f u and v will be will get interchanged i u minus v it is i into f so uh, i u plus i u minus v okay uh, Fine. Yes, ma'am. And the same technique as before, as for alpha greater than or equal to zero now, will give you. This. Okay. We will get. Okay. Now, can you come? put everything together and get the required. So remember, we have to now do what? Take general alpha. So alpha is A plus IB. And AB is in R, not R plus. Okay. So if I combine alpha is minus one and alpha greater than or equal to zero, I can say for all alpha in R, Yes, ma'am. So, since um, e likhe ki okay, we are writing e. And then now you can compute this for okay. How am I writing this part? What have I done? What am I using? Which property? The last line that I did. What are we using here? F yes. Plus G. F plus G. Yeah, using that equation we for which we just proved earlier before we started on the scalar multiple, right? And because now A is real, so this of course is fine. And because we have shown for I, iota, and then again applying for real, I get okay. So, have we finished everything that I wrote down in the statement, or anything remains? This is what we had to prove, and we have done it. Yeah. Okay. Now, 
I think how much time? Okay, we have a little bit more time. Let me quickly finish one more obvious thing that you would expect to hold. Yeah, you have 13 more minutes, ma'am. Sorry? You have 13 minutes, one three. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sure you remember Riemann integration from your undergraduate work. Yes? Do you? And there you would have written this, maybe proven a theorem in the beginning, and then we use this all the time for Riemann, isn't it? Okay, so now we need to prove this that the modulus of the Lebesgue integral of a Lebesgue integrable function is less than equal to the integral of the modulus function, modulus of the function. Okay, so let me start it like this. This is quite so where is z what kind of a number is it is complex number could it be infinity no ma'am why because uh, f is l1 yes so this is We have shown, we have defined integral f d mu and said because each of the components in the definition is finite, this thing is a finite, is a complex number, it can't be infinity. So we find an alpha and c such that okay. And we let u to be the real part of alpha f. Okay. So now, therefore, what do we know? Since u is the real part, u will be less than or equal to mod u, which is mod of alpha f and that's going to be just mod f okay and if i write x okay so i so the statement is with x and it could easily have been some E belonging to M and there wouldn't be much difference in the proof. So what is this? This is just mod Z because I took Z to be integral FD mu and that's just by the choice we have made with alpha. I'm just writing down what each of these stands for. And because of the last result, I can take alpha inside. Okay. So now it's clear this quantity on the extreme left is a non-negative number. So we know. So let me call this one. This is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Uh, and in 
Tech Pro. Remember what is U? U is the real part of L5. Is that clear? Because this is nothing but real part of L5 d mu plus i times uh, imaginary part of and because of 2 this is definitely real so this imaginary bit has to be 0 okay so this must be 0 so you get What do we have here? Uh, what did I name this number? Okay. Because u is less than what if, okay? So we are done with this. So the basic, basic uh, equalities and inequalities about the complex in Lebesgue, integ uh, Lebesgue integral for complex functions is taken care of now. So now we can move forward. So these are most of all these results are things which you have seen earlier in the case of non-negative integr um, integrals, okay? And after this, we come to one of the, one of the most important results which allow us to work with such integrals and which allow us to exchange the limit and the integral functions, uh, processes really. Uh, have you seen the Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem? Did Professor Sarkar did do it for you already? Okay, he's not done it for uh, real also. He seemed to think he would do it, but never mind. Okay. So let me give you the statement and we'll start with the proof next time, maybe. So what are the theorems you have done so far which allow you to interchange some limiting process and the integral? Monotone convergence theorem, Fatou's lemma. And Fatou's lemma. So those are, we'll use them to prove our Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem. So in monotone convergence theorem, you need your functions to be monotonic. Okay. We no longer have that requirement in this case. Of course, uh, we have complex valued functions. Now we have moved on to complex valid functions, so we can't expect to have such things. So here is the statement. So you have a sequence of complex measurable functions on X, and suppose they are pointwise convergent. on X. Okay, for every. So we want to know that if I apply an integral sign, if I integrate, can I compute the integral of the limit by looking at the 
limit of the integrals of the fn's so yes provided this condition holds So fn's are in some sense dominated by a function g, and g is Lebesgue integrable. Sorry. Then we can say the following things. First thing, the limit is also Lebesgue integrable. Okay, I don't think we're writing x. So this should maybe stick to the same notation. And this is, of course, a consequence. In fact, the proof is a straightforward corollary of Fatu's lemma. Okay. So we'll see the proof next time. I hope you were able to follow most of what I said today. Okay, so I'll stop here. Any questions?